Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for joining part three of our Infor Cloud Suite Industrial Five Part Web Series. Presenting today is Helmuth Cody. Helmuth has is a senior consultant with Guide Technologies. He has been working with CSI product for 20 years and has an abundance of manufacturing experience as well. During today's presentation, the lines will be muted. We ask that you use the question box on your menu there to ask any questions you might have. and They will be answered either throughout the presentation or at the end. And this will be recorded and recording will be sent out either later this afternoon or tomorrow morning. So with further ado, I'm gonna let Helmuth take it away. Hey, thank you, Elsa. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Like Elsa said, welcome to uh, part three of our webinar series. This one's on factory track. Um, I'm going to mute my camera here in just a second. Uh, but before we get going, I just wanna remind everybody that even though you're on, uh, your microphones are muted, if you have questions, use your little uh, chat box down at the bottom uh, to, to enter your questions there. And then when we're all finished and wrapped up, uh, Elsa will uh, work as a moderator and she will be uh, uh, fielding those questions or at least raising those questions so I can field them. And then without any further ado, here we go. So uh, thanks again for joining us. So. Factory track. We're going to cover a couple of agenda items today. Uh, bear with me as I move things around my screen. So uh, a few things we're going to ask. What is factory track? We'll, we'll talk about what factory track is. We'll talk about how factory track is integrated into, uh, into CSI with CSI. We'll give you some pointers on how to know if you need factory track and maybe how to build an ROA proposition uh, to, your, uh, to your senior management or ownership. And we'll talk about factory track implementation best practices. So the first question is, what is factory track? Well, I can, I can show you the, uh, the kind of uh, textbook definition. It's a comprehensive suite of products, automation products, enabling end-to-end -end automation connecting the plant floor and the back office. But I, I think maybe uh, most people on this call want something a little deeper than that, kind of what, what does that really mean? So factory track, even though a lot of people, when they say factory track, they think just the shop floor, um, it is much more than that. Uh, factory track actually is comprised of three different products. Time track, which is the attendance automation piece of the product. Shop floor, which is the plant floor execution or manufacturing execution system and warehouse mobility, which is an inventory management system. Now, I think where it gets confusing for a lot of people, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on, uh, there are some pieces within shop floor that allow you to do some inventory management. And there are some pieces within warehouse mobility that allow you to do some plant floor, floor execution. And we'll talk about the differences and what that means. So this is a, a screen scrape. And by the way, uh, in full disclosure, I will not be going into the software as a fully featured demo today. Um, I've taken some screenshots. You're, you are looking at a PowerPoint. I don't want to pretend like I'm trying to pre present it or pass it off as something other than that. Uh, but this is to give you a flavor and an idea um, around the factory track solution. So this is a, a kind of a screen scrape of factory track seven. And seven is the version of factory track that is um, compatible with uh, CSI version 10. Uh, and as you can see, this is actually a factory track uh, click once client. So the click once client isn't really what you uh, what your users on the shop floor or your handheld device users would use, but this has certain administration features to it and functions to it. It looks very similar to CSI. Uh, that is because uh, it's intentional. It's, it's because it's built upon the Mongoose framework. So we're going to talk about there's a lot of different menu options, different forms in Factory Track, Click Once Client. We're not going to talk about all of them. I'm going to delve into really the three main areas we just talked about: uh, the functionality of Time Track, the functionality mostly of Shop Floor, and also Warehouse Mobility. So um, the Time Track uh, part of the solution gives us the ability to, um, you know, basically record the data collection pieces of labor that would feed payroll um, and 
have some controls around that. So in order to make that happen, there's some administration forms that we would use. There are some payroll forms if we actually are feeding payroll, whether we're calculating payroll or, uh, or, or exporting payroll to be calculated in a, in a third party system. Um, some time track specific forms about how um, payroll shifts, um, payroll years, uh, things like that are set up, payroll weeks, periods. Uh, some queries to go in and look at the time track transactions and reports to do the same. And some time track utilities that we can use to, uh, uh, that we need to use on occasion to uh, you know, reconcile data and to reset uh, for a period and go to the next period, things like that. Very similar to what you would expect in, uh, in CSI. Uh, so that's, that is time track, and those are the things that we would see and do in time track. Moving into uh, shop floor, shop floor is um, more specifically geared to the shop floor, as you might imagine. So here we're gonna see um, some forms that are around Kanban and labor uh, and material in and out of jobs or production schedules, uh, miscellaneous transactions, and some time in attendance. And see, that's where we start crossing over now. You see some material there and you uh, uh, folder and a time in attendance folder and you think, oh, well, if I have shop floor, I have everything that I need for, um, for time track, for instance. Well, not quite because Time and attendance for the shop floor allows you to clock in and off, you know, clock in and out of the job, uh, in and out to lunch and those sorts of things, but it doesn't really provide you any of the capture for calculation for payroll and, and that sort of stuff. So uh, really it's gonna come down to, and, and I'll cover this at the end, um, kind of uh, in, the, uh, in, in the implementation piece, uh, what do you want to achieve? What do you want your solution to provide you? And that really guides your decision on what which of the three products that you need. And then the last one we'll get into is warehouse mobility. Uh, this is where we will see uh, field service transactions, inbound transactions such as receipts on purchase orders and receipts on transfer orders and maybe even RMAs, um, inquiries about where uh, uh, quantities on hand are, what locations they are, what warehouses they're in, uh, what lots and serial numbers. Uh, inventory count, that's where we'll uh, be able to do things like cycle counting and physical inventory. Um, inventory transactions or the quantity moves that we're all used to in CSI and the miscellaneous issues and receipts or quantity adjustments for the, for the, right, uh, <clears throat> for, for the right types of items. Uh, Kanban, which you don't see in CSI, uh, allows us to actually send out some Kanban requests from the, uh, from the cell of the work center, uh, get those fulfilled and staged. Um, so that's a little unique there that uh, you don't have with CSI, but you would have with warehouse mobility. Outbound transactions, uh, those would be shipment of customer orders. Um, uh, maybe shipment of, uh, if I'm doing outside process, purchase orders, and I need to, to send that purchase order out and get a, get a, uh, a packing list for that purchase order. Uh, production, reporting the production, re reporting the pieces that I've completed, the pieces I moved, so everything through with from one operation to another or from a job uh, into inventory. Time and attendance, as I mentioned before, the ability to log in and out of, uh, uh, clock in and out and say I'm here, but this is not on and off of a job. This would be more for your indirect employees, uh, the ones that are material handlers, uh, driving the fork trucks, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and then some utilities that would be uh, used in and around warehouse mobility. So as you can see, the, uh, the look and feel is laid out very, very similar to, uh, to CSI. All right, so uh, we're gonna go ahead and jump in and take a look under the covers here, what it might look like to someone on a handheld or someone uh, on a kiosk on the shop floor. I'm just gonna walk down through all the options that are available on this thing called the Work Center Navigation Home, uh, just to give you a flavor uh, of, of uh, a factory track. So we are in Work Center Navigation Home here, or at least a screenshot of it. And this is really from shop floor. So this is under the time and attendance. You can see over on the left uh, is highlighted. Uh, over on the right, you've got your options. And these are all security and permission based options. So this is a clock in for the day or clock out for the day. Go to break, return from break. Go to lunch, return from lunch. 
do a timesheet summary. And this uh, employee time off request over there at the end allows the employees to submit a time off request. And then the supervisor through the former uh, view that I showed you, the uh, uh, click once client or even the, uh, the web client, uh, <clears throat> the fully featured robust factory track uh, would allow supervisors to uh, approve or, or reject those. The material uh, submenu. Uh, this is where I would issue materials to jobs or return them off of jobs, or maybe do a job move or a job receipt. You know, a job move is moving uh, moving quantities from one operation to to the next. A job receipt is taking it from that very last operation. Um, maybe I've got four operations uh, or you know 40 operations on a job and none of those are set as control points and the very last one is where i report and back flush everything and i can bring it straight into inventory uh, we can do that with a job receipt it's very similar to the job receipt you see in csi a work center issue if i'm doing uh if i'm doing production schedules uh, and i want and i need to issue extra material to the work center because when i'm back flushing is insufficient or was wrong or it was too much uh, i can do a work center material issue transaction or run just in time production Again, it's a JIT transaction, just as you would see it in uh, behind the scenes, just as you would see it in CSI, but it's uh, made a little more user friendly uh, for the for the front end on the shop floor. Production schedule receipt, if I'm doing production schedules, service repair order, uh, issuing materials to SRO, a visual serial assignment. So this is where you get a visual look at the serial numbers uh, and can assign them or uh, create them. And then material issues for projects, if I'm using the project control module. This is an example of what the job material issue form would look like within uh, within uh, shop track, shop track, no, factory track, shop floor. I might do that like a hundred more times. I'll try not to. Factory track, shop floor, job material issue. So uh, the job is the, uh, the job number you see, which could be scanned in or keyed in or used with a mouse on a drop down and the suffix we're all used to that you pick the operation that you're uh, recording on and then uh, under the material that is limited or pre-filtered by the material that is available on that operation and then you would be able to see at the bottom how much is required how much is remaining what's available uh, how much has already been issued uh, so you have a good visual to that also you'll notice that there's a tab that's not highlighted called lot and serial if any of my materials are lot tracked or serial tracked, I would go to that tab and handle all my uh, lot and serial details related to the material that I'm issuing. And then the Kanban. So this is a, uh, I'm sorry, this is, it's kind of a little bit out of order, my apologies. This is the, the labor. So the uh, work center and the startup uh, starts set up in setup, start run, end run. This is uh, this is where I would do the equivalent to what I would do in CSI from a uh, like an unposted job transaction, for instance. So um, the difference being, of course, with an unposted job transaction in CSI, you typically would go in and say, "This is the job I'm on. This is the operation I'm on. This is how long I worked. This is how many pieces I did." And this is where I'm moving it to either the next operation or into inventory uh, where the whole idea here as far as uh, capturing your labor is you would go and say okay I'm going to start run and then uh, I go off and, and start doing my job and when I'm done I come back and end run and it says oh okay so here's the elapsed time it took you an hour between when you said start run and end run how many pieces did you complete how many of them were scrapped how many are being moved to the next operation? So uh, same same idea with the start setup and end setup. All right, uh, a couple of transactions there, end run only. Uh, so what an end run only does, it allows me to kind of stack up uh, job after job and I just report at the end of it instead of having to hit the start and it just assumes when the start time was uh, based on when the last end run was. Uh, some indirect times, start indirect, end indirect, and then like typical CSI, you would give it your indirect code, then it would know what GL account number and unit code for the department to code it to for the transaction. Uh, start machine and end machine, and then a couple of them that you see in the very bottom, 
kind of book ending that bottom row. Work set maintenance and team maintenance, those are used in conjunction and they are to afford you the capability to be able to report on and work in teams within factory track. So what you might see is someone coming in and hitting start run and then going back to the job material issue form and issuing material to their job. And then when they're all finished, they come back and hit end run and then it gets the elapsed time and ask you for how many pieces you did. So this is an example of a start run transaction. Uh, looks pretty similar, I think, to uh, what we just saw with the material issue. And it's a very much scaled down, simplified version of what you might be used to looking at in the uh, unposted job transaction. So you scan or key in your job number and the suffix of the job and the operation. And then um, it gives you a little information there at the bottom. It says, you know, how much was the job quantity? What, what is the job status? Is it released? Yeah. Uh, how many were received at this Operation 10 that we're working on? 50 of them. How many were completed? None. None have been moved. None have been scrapped. So the balance is 50. And then if I need to see a little bit more information, maybe, I, maybe I'm not working on the first operation, but I'm somewhere downstream, and I want to be able to look up or down and have an understanding of what actually has been done on this job in WIP up until now, I can see it by clicking on the progress tab or tapping on the progress tab on a touch sensitive screen. And then all my operations would be listed there, the work centers that uh, the operations are set up for, and then my quantities received, completed, scrapped, moved, and the status of the operation. And then moving into Kanban. So uh, within Kanban, I can issue a replenishment, replenishment request. I can check the status of that replenishment. I can uh, do the staging of the material in response to that and then receive that at my, in my cell or my work center. Uh, print labels or a pick list. I can run a report that sees, says all my staged items or, uh, or generate a Kanban replenishment or a just-in-time replenishment. Uh, again, features that you don't see within natively within CSI. But the very last category there is miscellaneous. So in the miscellaneous, we've got things such as the visual dispatch. Um, that's where you can look at, uh, you know, jobs by resource or work center and say, you know, see what jobs are to be done and the order maybe uh, in which to do them. That gets updated based on when scheduling runs and the priorities and so forth that are inherent within CSI. Um, I can look at a job status uh, report um, and I can look at uh, label, printing labels, look at label issues and re uh, requirements and so forth. Documents, if I'm using IDM, uh, I can go and look at uh, documents that are maybe attached to a routing, bill of material, the job itself. Also, if I'm doing QCSM process, this is where I would disposition um, from the shop floor. I would disposition uh, in process at each operation, uh, maybe record test records. Uh, if I'm using inventory containers, uh, that, that capability within CSI, I can build a container or empty a container here uh, or manage it. And then I can look at resources group and the skills management and understand kind of what's required by the job specific requirements based on re and what resources within a resource group um, I should be using based on their skills or known skills. So it's good visibility right there on the shop floor, right there at your fingertips from maybe a, from a, a kiosk that might even be touch screen. This is what I call the many interfaces of factory track. So you can see here, just showing you an example of how robust this solution can be. Uh, you know, we've got a desktop monitor there, we've got a tablet, uh, we've got a cell phone or some sort of a smartphone, uh, and then we've got a handheld device. So I'm gonna walk you through kind of what it might look like. Um, I don't quite wanna say a day in the life because it's not gonna go that date deep, but, uh, uh, what is going to be the user experience for the user using a handheld? So one of the first things they're going to do is log in, right? So they're going to pick up the handheld and they're going to go to their login. Uh, and this is what their login form would look like. Uh, and let's say, you know, they're, uh, this, is, this is a warehouse mobility example. 
um, let's say they've uh, they've got permissions for all of these uh, things. Uh, so they'll get this menu presented to them, where um, you touch it uh, and it and it picks the menu, the sub menu. Uh, make it that would be like a uh, a JIT transaction. Uh, move it that would be to move it from one location to another, or one warehouse to another. Get it that's an inbound transaction. Ship it. Uh, Self-explanatory, going out on a on a shipment on a truck, doing an inventory count, doing Kanban, time and attendance, field service, and various utilities. So let's presume that somebody reached up there and tapped that get it button. They're going to see inbound transaction submenu, which uh, includes purchase receipts, putaways, transfer order receipts, and maybe the QCS test results and QCS disposition for QC supplier. Uh, let's say that they chose to uh, do a purchase order receipt. This is an example of what they might see. They would get a, a, a form or a screen that would show them the type of transaction they're doing. They could pick that. The warehouse, the purchase order, which they could either scan in or key in. And then scan in or key in the line number or the item number, uh, input the document number. And when they're done, it creates the receipt transaction in CSI. So that was kind of what it looks like to somebody using a handheld. So how is factory track integrated with CSI? Well, we kind of touched on this a little bit before, but if you're used to using unposted job transactions and this, this form, uh, probably isn't foreign to you. Uh, what we have here is the job number and the suffix, the operation number, the type of transaction, uh, transaction date. If this were um, a run type transaction, it'd be prompting me for an employee number and a shift. It would prompt me for the production that I've done, the pieces completed, the pieces scrapped, the pieces moved. And again, if it were a run type operation, then it would be prompting me for either a start and end time or a total number of hours, right? And then it asked me for, you know, if I'm gonna move any, where's it gonna go? What's the next operation? So in this case, this example, it's uh, doing a transaction in operation 10. Uh, I, I completed a piece, I'm moving a piece, and I'm moving it to the next operation, which is an outside work center. Um, so this, actual transaction, this unposted job transaction is created in CSI as a result of doing what I call paired up or matched transactions in factory track. So uh, if, if this were a run transaction, for example, in factory track, maybe I did a start run, went away for an hour, came back and did an end run, then the elapsed time would be a total of one hour. It would have merged the two transactions together to know the starting time and the end time, and it would have created a single transaction um, and put it into the unposted job transaction. Now that unposted job transaction can be posted automatically um, or can be queued up for a little while. Those are implementation decisions. Similarly, when I do a, a warehouse mobility transaction, for instance, or a uh, issue to a job from, from the shop floor, uh, I get a material transaction that uh, is a legit material transaction within CSI. Uh, and it would look just like this. So it would have a transaction number and a date and the type of the transaction it was and a reference that it was a jet from a job um, or inventory. Uh, anything that you would get from natively doing these transactions fully featured within CSI, you're going to get those transaction records directly in CSI from factory track. And this, this is just an example of the job transactions after they're posted. You, know, you take an unposted job transaction, you post it, you have a job transaction. Um, you end up with those in CSI as well. So the question is, you know, how is Factory Track integrated with CSI? And the answer is it's fully integrated. It's completely integrated. Um, employees that are in CSI are available in Factory Track. Departments that are in CSI are available in Factory Track. I enter the job, release the job in, in CSI. It shows up in factory track to be worked on. Um, item numbers, locations, warehouses, et cetera, fully integrated. So 
At this point, you might be asking yourself, how do I know if I need factory track? That's a great question. Ask yourself, do you need to reduce costs? Do you need to increase productivity? Do you need to remain competitive? And if the answer to those is yes, and <clears throat> let's be real, uh, probably to all of us on this call and everyone who's not on the call, the answer is yes. Um, but that's just not enough. So what does factory track do to help me reduce cost, increase productivity, and remain competitive? And we're going to talk about that. So <clears throat> cost reductions, and this is really aimed at helping you kind of develop that um, cost benefit proposal for ROI. And if you're trying to, um, you know, get the spend for a factory track type solution. So reduce cost, that comes from the increased accuracy and reduced carrying cost of inventory. Um, increased shipping accuracy potentially will decrease returns or credits, right? Um, it might even increase uh, your uh, delivery of full on time to your customer uh, score. Uh, so your, now your vendor scorecard with your customer is getting better uh, and lowers overhead. Increased productivity is to simplify and automate the transactions coming from the shop floor directly into your ERP and to eliminate the waste. Uh, you know, kind of think about the, uh, <clears throat> the I, I'm going to call it old school, I don't mean to offend anybody, but the old school method of having your factory employees write down on a piece of paper. Uh, here's the job I worked on, here is the pieces I did, and here's where they went. And if they were lot tracked, here's lot number. If they were serial tracked, here's the serial number. And then that all gets collected up at the end of the day and comes in and gets handed into somebody, maybe that's a clerk that's keying that stuff in, or maybe not a clerk, maybe somebody that's doing it, you know, kind of in their, in the pockets of the time that they can carve out, maybe a planner or somebody. Um, uh, you have an uh, opportunity for error. You have an opportunity for waste. You're taking that person's very valuable time that they could be using to be a better planner and to make better decisions with uh, the resources of the company, and you're asking them to basically do data entry. Um, so that's your increased productivity. And to remain competitive. It, allow, it allows you to react faster. It makes you a more agile uh, provider and a supplier to your customers. It improves your compliance ability and your traceability for things like you know, recalls, light controls, serial numbers, um, compliance programs, Rojas, et cetera. Uh, it gives you real-time visibility into what's flowing through the shop floor. So when you, uh, when you run planning or when someone goes and looks to see where something is from an in-process perspective, um, you're, look, you're seeing where it really is so you can make a better decision. You always, you always get a better answer when you ask a better question. And uh, this allows you the data and the information and the intelligence to ask a better question. And that uh, can't help but increase uh, your customer satisfaction scores. So import factory track, it actually bridges the gap from the factory <clears throat> to your supply chain, your customers, and your employees. In other words, all of your stakeholders. And that is Really, the very first question we ask, what is factory track? That's what factory track is. So let's talk about implementation. Um, we'll go through some best practices. And these really shouldn't be any surprises to anybody because a factory track implementation is really nothing more than a implementation, right? A business software implementation, a system. So the very first thing you need to do is create a plan. Um, create a detailed plan. Don't leave anything to the imagination or anything, any assumptions out there. Draft a fully fledged implementation project plan. Assemble yourself a team of business process owners. Now, maybe it's a smaller team than you would normally do for a full ERP implementation, uh, but make sure you've got the right people in the right positions on that team to make the decisions and to understand the processes and to be able to. Um, you know, handle the change management task of getting everybody else on board with this. Um, make sure you budget correctly. Budget for hardware, obviously. 
You may not have handhelds, you may not have kiosks. So budget for your hardware. Uh, think about data migration. What are you using right now for uh, kind of a shop floor execution program or a, a warehouse uh, management program? If you're using CSI, that's fine. There's no data to migrate, that's beautiful. I mean, you've got a few codes and parameters you'd wanna load within factory track, but that's it. If you're using Brand X, then you know you need to you need to put a price tag on that uh, based on the level of effort it's going to take you to get from Brand X to to Factory Track. Um, business modeling and piloting. I can't stress this enough. Make sure you put enough time in your project plan to adequately business model all your scenarios. Uh, and what you do with your business modeling is you're actually creating your pilot scripts. And your pilot scripts are the, kind of the litmus test of how your pilot is ultimately gonna, gonna succeed or fail each task within it, right? So uh, make sure you're doing business modeling and, pay, and, and giving that, investing enough time and effort in that, into that uh, as to what it deserves. Uh, and then do the piloting. Uh, make sure you do, I would say, iterative rounds of piloting because you're gonna change things a couple times, maybe in the first pilot, and then you're gonna go back and business model that, make sure you nailed it down, get everybody on board, and then you're gonna pilot that business model and so on and so forth. And that typically is a kind of a, a cyclical three-time thing. And then don't overlook the training, the training for your end users. Uh, th these are the men and women that you are counting on to get the right data in, so don't scrimp on their, on their training. Make sure they are comfortable, make sure they are uh, educated uh, with how, how you want the processes to be running. Make sure they have good documentation at their fingertips that they can refer back to. Make sure that the training is adequately, not only planned for, but budgeted for. Um, like any good leader, leaders go first, right? So what this is, it's a little graphic of a bunch of people in a team, assumingly standing around, in the inside of an aircraft with the door open and parachutes on. So, Helen, you're the team leader. Why don't you jump first? As they say, leaders go first. Uh, it's, it's really impossible to lead from the behind. You have to lead from the front. Little tongue in cheek, work from home humor there. Okay, further on best practices, determine what your needs are. All right, so what are you going to do on the shop floor? Are you going to be doing production reporting? Are you going to be doing labor reporting? How much of your production reporting is actually back flushed versus reported or calculated? Uh, do you have both labor and machines? If so, are you back flushing machines? Are you, are you reporting machines and back flushing labor? You know, you're going to have to come up with some of those decisions. Uh, but before you can come up with the decisions, you're going to have to know kind of what your needs are, right? Do you have a requirement for teams to report? And if you don't have a requirement, do you have an application for that? Is it good? Is it a good thing for teams? Do you, do you really... Maybe you haven't had this capability before, but you're looking at it going, wow, that really makes a lot of sense. That would streamline things for me. Do you have QC? Do you have it on the shop floor? What are your needs for the warehouse? Do you do cycle counting? Do you do physical inventories? How about customer shipping? Do you use QC customer and do you use uh, certificates of conformance? How about any kidding? Do you do that? Uh, PO receipts. Uh, when you get a PO receipt in, do you put it directly into um, a staging area and then put it away? You know, what's your process? Because your process is going to define how you roll out factory track warehouse mobility. Um, warehouse location, stock moves, material staging for job picks and shipping, all of that. Make sure you get those processes documented and written down. And time and attendance. Are you interfacing with payroll? Do your employees need to be able to? Uh, have access to a self-service kiosk to, you know, put in time off requests and so forth. Uh, do you record indirect time? How do you do that? What's that look like? So in summary, what is Factory Track? We talked about it. It's a fully featured suite of products that include time track, job floor, and warehouse mobility. How is Factory Track integrated with CSI? Oh, it's completely integrated with CSI. How do I know if I need factory track? You're gonna to have to do a self-assessment um, and then you're gonna to have to do the sell job of convincing the, the people that write the checks that this is an asset for your organization. 
and the implementation best practices we covered. Really no secret there. It's just like you're doing any other software implementation. Uh, treat it with respect. It's due. It is a project. Treat it like one. Uh, and I think you'll do fine. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Elsa as our moderator and see if we have any questions. We have a question that came through in regards to how long does a typical factory track implementation take? That is a great question. Um, so I have seen a factory track implementation, and, and I want to I want to couch around the word typical. Um, I have seen factory track implementations done um, as part of like we call it phase one as part of your standard ERP implementation, and it's just baked into that. Um, which does push out that date a little bit. And I've seen them done as kind of after the fact, phase two plus X. Uh, and it really depends um, on how complex your shop floor is, uh, how many of the three modules you're implementing. But I would say probably on the low end, six to eight weeks minimum. Um, and it could, it could go up to, you know, four months, uh, really depending on how, large your organization is, how complex it is, um, and how much a, a big factor is, how much bandwidth and time your people have to do it. Great question. Anything else? Yeah, given the today's climate, can an implementation like this be started remotely? Is this something that requires in-person consulting services? Another very timely and very good question. Thank you for whomever asked that. Um, you know, that, that I'm going to use a takeaway from what we are actually doing um, day to day right now. The entire guide consulting team is obviously working remotely. We are doing things that we've never done completely remotely before. Um, I would say that uh, is it optimum? No. But can you do it when you need to? Absolutely, you can do things remotely. So uh, what you what you could do is you just have to be creative, right? So you uh, you can handle all your meetings. That's not a problem. Handle all your training, not a problem. Do that remotely. Uh, but then when you start getting into the Q and A sessions and things like that, questions and answer sessions that pop up, um, we've handled it a couple different ways. Um, have one client out in the west coast that got surprised with the, uh, the lockdown order early on and uh we you know that was that was on a weekend and we had activities scheduled the following week um so those activities were a post education q a sessions to go through all of operations and csi uh, and factory track would be no different so the way we handled them uh, because suddenly their entire workforce became unavailable. Uh, they were not only working from home, they suddenly had a boatload of other things they had to do. So the time that they had dedicated to the implementation was stripped away for that week immediately. So what we did was uh, we recorded a series of uh, videos. Um, I asked all the BPOs to submit me the list. Well, actually, I already had the list of all their questions that they were going to ask for Q&A. And then I just used that and I crafted some videos, very specifically, very targeted videos to answer all the questions. And then in that process, I did what we would normally do in a live session because typically a question might invoke one or two more questions. And I would um, kind of presume what those extra questions would be and ask them as well. So good question. Yes, we can do it all remotely if we have to, but we can certainly very easily prepare for it and then pivot into an on-site for the remainder of it afterwards. Great. Looks like at this time, that's all the questions we have. All righty. Well, I thank everybody for being here. Don't forget about parts four and part five of our series. I'll let Elsa go ahead and talk about that. Yep, as you can see, we have part four coming up on April 16th. That will be presented by Pat Armour. Yes, sorry, Pat is new to our team and I drew a complete blank on his last name. Pat Armour, thank you, Helmuth. 
Will we present that I one? Was, I was taking a drink of coffee when you uh, when you paused. One of those. The working at home is getting everybody. Yep. And then we have part five scheduled for May 14th. So as always, thanks for joining. And quick question. Yes, part one and two are available. All recordings are always available on the guide website under the resource tab videos, but I can also send them out to you as well. And I will do that for you, Bill. And if you any other if you'd like any other recordings, please don't hesitate to contact me directly. With that, we'll wrap it up. Thank you, Helmuth, and thank you all for joining. Thanks, everybody. Stay, stay safe, stay strong, stay happy.